Good Friday morning, everyone. We're glad that you could wake up with us this morning for day three of our 4-H Civic Engagement Workshop. My name is Steve McKinley from the State 4-H Office, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, glad to see several of you back and a couple of new faces this morning. So we've got a, a great day ahead of a couple of hours of opportunities that we have to learn, and we're going to get right into that this morning. But first off, if you've not yet told us that you're here and want to do that, that would be very helpful. Uh, there's the purdue.ag slash CE20 participation link. It's also in the chat box if you want to take a look at that you can go sign in for us real quick uh, as we do that just a couple of things I think most of you have heard this before but I'm going to say it again just in case but as you know if you could keep your mics muted while others are talking that's going to help with feedback issues if you're having any problems with connectivity uh, please feel free to uh, turn your video monitor off otherwise we're happy to see your faces uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat box you're going to have a chance to do that with three of our panelists this morning and then our speaker a little bit later uh, so please uh, chat away with us that'd be great and if you want to open up a mic and talk to us that's fine too as always we're going to be respectful and considerate of others and just a reminder this program is being recorded uh, I think everybody has heard this spiel before, but we are part of 4-H, and 4-H is a national program. It involves about 6 million people nationwide uh, for students in grades 3 through 12. In Indiana, Purdue University is a land-grant institution that leads the 4-H program. We have a 4-H educator in every county, at least one, and they are supported by a number of 4-H volunteers that really make things work. Uh, you learn a lot of different life skills that you can use throughout your life uh, in 4-H, 60-some uh, different projects or subjects that you can learn from and if you'd like to learn more Google Indiana 4-H and you can find out more about that information. Day three we are doing the international experiences that's going to be kicking off here very shortly you've got to, there's there's really cool pictures coming out, but even better information that our panelists are going to be able to provide to you. And then we'll be able to have a conversation about how we can work together more effectively with other people, those that are like us and those that might be a little bit different from us. The resources we've used the last couple of days are already posted at the 4-H Academy or 4-H Civic Engagement website page and the videos will be coming soon. It's taken a little while to download those, but they'll be coming up soon so that you'll be able to, to see it again if you'd like to or share it with friends that maybe couldn't join us. We will do a quick round of introductions from your workshop hosts. Katie, we'll let you start. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Sweet. I'm the 4-H Youth Development I'm an Extension Educator in Hendrix County. And I'm Dan Miller. I'm the, I am a 4-H uh, uh, club leader from Vanderburgh County. I'm Doug Keenan, 4-H uh, Educator in Noble County. Oh, and I'm Steve McKinley. I work at State 4-H office. <laughs> I was letting people in the room. Sorry, <laughs> wasn't paying attention. But we are glad that you're here. And Katie, we're going to let you do a quick introductions with folks. Absolutely. Welcome. So since it's a smaller group. Katie, Katie your, yeah, your mic is doing some weird things again this morning. Okay. Let me stop this. Okay. My internet is still a little slow today. That's much better. Here we go. So um, we do have a smaller group with us this morning. Um, some others might join after they maybe roll out of bed. But what we're going to do uh, today is we're going to go around the room and I will uh, call out a first name and I'd like you to tell us, introduce yourself, tell us your name, um, what county you're from. And then because we are talking about international stuff today, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Okay, so I'm gonna start with uh, Delia. My name is Delia, and I'd like to go to Japan. Oh. All right. Nice, nice. Thank you. Uh, Dominic. My name is Kiara, <laughs> and I would like to go to Athens, Greece. Oh, very good. All right, thank you. Uh, Tyler. My name is Tyler Weinzeffel. I'm in Vandenberg County, and I'd like to spend some time in Germany. Nice. Okay. Julian. My name is Julian. I'm from Porter County, and I would like to spend some time in probably Europe and Asia. Nice. All right. Tatiana? My name is Tatiana. Um, I'm from Marion County, and I'd like to go to the rainforest in Brazil. All right. 
Michael. I'm Michael Smelser. I live in LaPorte County. And if I could go anywhere in the world, I would go to Greece, but I would also uh, travel through Albania. Okay. All right. Uh, Janine? I'm Janine. And I'm from Puerto Rico, and I would like to go to Italy. Italy. All right. Arrington. My name is Arrington. I'm from Kosciuszko County, and I would like to go to Canada. Hmm. Okay. Josiah. I'm Josiah, Elkhart County. I'd like to go to Paraguay. Oh. <laughs> um, all right, I see a Kay Dixon. Maybe. All right, we'll maybe come back to them. Uh, David. Hi, I am David. I, Atkins, I live in Tippecanoe New County, and I think I would be interested in going to Japan. Thanks. So Katie, I had a response from Emma, actually, Emma Dixon in Cass County, and she's interested in going to Alaska, one of the right. states I would also like to go to. Awesome. So thank you guys all very much for joining us. Um, speakers, uh, panelists, when you guys introduce yourselves, um, if you would like to also tell us if you could, wherever you would like to go in the world, we would love to hear that as well. Whoever said Italy, mine was also Italy, so. All right, very cool. Thank you, Katie. Mine would be Australia. I think mm -hmm. that would be fun. I've not done that before. Seems like they have lots of cool little critters I could see when I go over there. But looking forward to that. And lots of scenery too, even even after the fires, I think. But we are excited this morning to welcome our international experience panel. Uh, we have three outstanding speakers that have been all kinds of places in the world for lots of reasons, uh, from living and as as where their residents are to uh, international work to other things that they might have done and so we're excited to be able to uh, welcome them this morning. Here the, are the pictures that look similar to what they look like now, maybe not exactly but similar anyway and I'll, I'll introduce each of the three of them and let them just do a, a brief remark and then we'll go into the actual presentations but Adagoki Adetunji has joined us. He's a student here at Purdue University. Uh, good morning Adagoki, welcome. Good morning, how are you? We are great. So glad that you could be with us again this year. Thank you for being here. Anything you'd like to say as we, as we kick off this morning? Uh, nothing yet, but yeah, but maybe I would like to go to Africa or Greece. I think I will. <laughs> yes. All right, excellent. Too, yeah. Very cool. Amanda. Good morning. We're glad that you could be with us as well. Amanda Dixon, she is our Purdue International Extension Specialist, has lots of cool opportunities in that role. Amanda, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. And um, I have two countries where I'd like to go. Greece is one of them, and um, I'll be going there in April if, uh, you know, travel allows. And then uh, Rwanda in Africa. I am really interested in going there. Cool. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amanda. And Dr. Paul Ebner is a Purdue professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at the College of Agriculture. Uh, Paul, good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Good morning. Yeah, I'm the guy in the bottom middle and my beard was a little out of control in that picture. I can see that. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm a professor in animal sciences and I'll talk later about uh, how universities get involved in international projects and how students can get involved in them too. Um, at any time though, stop me and ask questions. I, and if there's one place I'd like to go, it would be Iran. Iran, right, very good. It uh, has, has beautiful scenery, people are really cool. Um, it seems like a very friendly place. 
Thank you very much. And, and what Dr. Ebner said is exactly correct for I think all of our presenters. If you have questions as we go, please feel free to type those in the chat. Uh, we've got a small enough group this morning. If you want to open up your mic and ask the question, that would be fine as well. Now we've given each of our presenters 15 minutes to do their presentations. They have so much to share. It's going to be hard to do that. We know but we're getting started a minute or two early. So that's good. And uh, what I will try to do presenters is let you know when we got a couple of minutes left in your 15 minute time slot. Um, and that will kind of hopefully keep us on track just a little bit. Uh, I think it may work best if I keep control of the slides. Just let me know if I'm not going quickly enough. And at a go key for your video, we figured out how to make it work, but I need to do a couple of things um, different. So we'll do a little bit of a transition when we get to your to okay. into your slides. So. Okay. We do have it and it's up and I know it plays. So we just, it may, we'll, we'll make sure I do it correctly for us. So as, as we go through that, but uh, let me move this slide here. Adagoki is going to be our first presenter this morning and he just has an incredible experience in his life. Um, not that many years, not that old, but he's done all kinds of wonderful things. And I'm, I'm excited that he gets to share that with us this morning. So welcome and you're up. All right. So, um, Already, my name is Ade Goki Ade Tunji. Uh, I wish I could meet you all in a classroom environment where I can demonstrate that and how you can pronounce it. So, but let's move on to the next slide. So, um, what I want to talk about this morning, uh, myself, my name, I said I would like to visit Africa again. Uh, the last time I was in Africa was seven years ago. Um, and also, I would like to go to Greece. I think that might be an interesting place to visit. And today, I want to talk about Nigeria, um, institutions, culture, and um, I want to talk about the intersection uh, of Nigeria and the US. And also, as young people, how you can be involved, how you can engage uh, in civic activities around the world and we'll take questions and comments. So next slide, please. So talking about Nigeria, that is the map of Africa. There are 54 countries in Africa and Nigeria happens to be one of them. Uh, and I know people always joke around to say, Africa is not a country. Um, so I know, I know we all know that Africa is not a country. <laughs> Africa is a continent, just like uh, every other continent that we know. And Nigeria is growing uh, fast. I don't know if we have figured out the family planning thing. So, <laughs> so people are still, <laughs> people are still uh, having kids and uh, now we are 190 million people and people are guessing that we are even more than one and maybe we are around 200 million people. So, and the GDP is about 405 uh, one billion USD and Nigeria is called the giant of Africa in terms of the population in terms of culture we are very diverse you find different people in in Nigeria and in terms of language we have about 520 languages and you have ethnic groups but in Nigeria uh, we have three major I don't like the word major because I don't think there is no one who is not major everyone is major but we use that a lot to say Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba. And I belong to the Yoruba uh, ethnic group in Nigeria. And Nigeria also, Lagos, Nigeria is a very big place. Uh, it's just like you go to New York, you see different people um, in that city, in that mega city, Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, next slide, please. So that is our president. Uh, this morning I was thinking about it and I don't want no people to accuse me of ageism. And I was like, why do we always elect 74, 75 year old people <laughs> to rule our countries? <laughs> Just <laughs> in Nigeria, in America. So you have people of that age ruling. And uh, we look at the system of government. It's kind of similar to what we have in America, uh, but in terms of the number of states, in the US, we have 50 states, but in Nigeria, we only have uh, 36 uh, states. And we have governors that are uh, democratically elected to, to run those states. And we have local governments. So local gov the ideal of local government is kind of similar to what we have in the US, 
where you have uh, the mayors uh, running uh, local communities, like where we are right now in West Lafayette. I know we are in different places, but we all belong to uh, local communities. So, and there is ideal of power sharing among those uh, tiers of government. I mean, uh, the federal government, the state government, and the local government too. So we pra they practice uh, uh, democracy also uh, in Nigeria. We can go to the next one. And this is the map that represents different states in Nigeria. So when I say states in Nigeria, when you say it's just like you are talking about um, Indiana, Illinois, in the US, so it's kind of uh, similar. So we have those uh, uh, places also all over Nigeria. And interestingly, I was born here in Ocean State, which is a very small uh, town in Nigeria. And I grew up there as well. We can go to the next one. So um, next slide. So uh, I like this picture a lot. Uh, so, you know, I spoke about traditional, talk about local communities. So in Nigeria, it's kind of similar to what you have in the United Kingdom. Uh, you have the, you, we still, they still have the queen and they still have the prime minister. So in, in Nigeria too, we still have this idea of uh, kingship. You have people in local communities, you have traditional rulers. And traditional rulers also, they work together with the elected uh, representatives, but traditional rulers always see themselves as custodians of culture and tradition. Like we need to preserve our culture. We need to preserve our way of life. We need to preserve how we do things. You can see everyone in that type of attire that represents that culture, the way they dress. And you can see the king uh, and the entourage and the beautiful wife. So we're kind of flamboyant how, how we dress. Uh, because if you have money, if you are wealthy, you need to show off that you are really wealthy. And that is part of wearing flamboyant uh, attires as well. So we can go to the next one. And uh, another click. So, and you can see, this is just to represent uh, different ethnic groups in Nigeria. Uh, in, in our names, when you check out my name, it's very easy for you to know where I came from. Uh, in Nigeria, when you read my name, you know, oh, you are a Yoruba person. If I dress in traditional attire, you can know, oh, this is a Yoruba man. So the way we dress also, it's kind of, it signifies the, the culture or the group that we belong to. Next one. And uh, so you can see, this is a couple, uh, young people who just got married. And I, talk, I was talking about being flamboyant. In everything flamboyant, you throw a party, people are eating and drinking. You spend a lot of money in uh, expensive attires just to show people that you have arrived, I've made it. And everybody in the town should know that I've made it. So <laughs> that is part of, the, part of the culture. So you can see them, they look happy, and that is the traditional way to dress if you belong to my ethnic group. Next one. And also you can see young people too. You can see a woman uh, in the middle of two dramas, dancing, having good time. So we like to have good time too. And, uh, and I know Americans who have been to Nigeria, they always want to go back because of there is no rush. Uh, take your time to, to, do, to do everything. <laughs> Yeah, so we can go to the next one. And you can see happy family too. And young people in a way are doing things differently, but the ideal of uh, dressing well, looking good is still very paramount to the culture. And I believe on my right, that is a church, a group of people that is in a family setting, just to give you a picture of how Nigerians, their culture and nuances in that culture. So we can go to the next one, sir. So maybe we will leave this, this video uh, to the end, but I think it's an interesting video for you to really have an idea of the culture and what we believe and how people 
and also the intersection between America and Nigeria. If you look at popular culture, popular culture is not only in America. Popular culture is now all over the world. You will be surprised that you, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you will find people who are still buying into American popular culture. So that shows that we are in a global village. We are in a place that people interact one way or the other. And technology has brought that interaction. You might be surprised that Americans know a lot about Nigerians because they go on Instagram, they see the picture on Instagram, they see their posting on Twitter, they see them on YouTube. So in a way, even if you are not there, you have an idea of what is going on there. So maybe we can leave that picture, uh, that video will come back because of time. Um, so uh, thinking about uh, speaking with young high school uh, students uh, listening to us this morning, it's not just about talking about Nigeria. What are the opportunities for you uh, in Nigeria if you are interested in international work? And when I was listening to the introductions, I was sad that nobody, in a joking way, that nobody mentioned, I would like to go check out what's going on in Africa. So uh, there are opportunities there. If you are interested, there are American international schools in Nigeria. Uh, if you want to be a teacher, I think you might want to go teach English in Nigeria. Uh, you can go to Lagos, you can go to Abuja. Uh, you will be surprised when you get to Lagos and Abuja, you think you are in Europe. Uh, and again, you still find very uh, depressed places in Nigeria. So don't let me paint a picture of a rosy, heavenly place. There are good places that you will like. There are places that you will like, I need to get out of here right now because of the level of depression. So yeah, so American schools and US Department of State, uh, the US Embassy, we have, we have two offices in Nigeria. That can tell you Nigerians, young people, they want to come to America so bad. So, <laughs> and America recognizes that. So you can choose to work for the US in Nigeria as a young person. If you are in IT, Google is now in Nigeria. If you are interested in agriculture, there are a lot of things to do in agriculture in Nigeria. If you are interested in mining, uh, Nigeria happens to have a lot of a lot of natural resources. We have crude oil, we have gold, we have anything you can think about. Nigeria happens to be a very wealthy country, but we have very poor leadership. So that is why the country is still backward. So uh, if you are interested in waste management, if you go to Lagos, there are a lot to do in Lagos in terms of waste management. So you can expand where you want to work, what do you want to do with yourself uh, by checking out some of these opportunities that are available in other places. Uh, we, can go in, we can move to the next one. So let's talk about, quickly talk about, uh, I like to talk about the next slide, talk about when we think about being in America and think about being in the world, what are the challenges that are common to maybe Nigeria, common to America, or challenges that we can find around the world? And one of them, we talk about climate change. Uh, it's not only an American issue, it's all over the world. And as young high school students, what can you do? How can you help? What would be your contribution? That will be part of your global civic engagement as young uh, people. Extreme poverty uh, is not only in America that people are poor. There are poor people all over the world. Uh, the first time I, I went to New York, I saw Pan Handler. That was in 2010. Uh, I was shocked so because the idea was that America is so rich. Everybody is rich in America. And I saw people in, 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 I mean, in New York asking, can I get a quarter? I was like, no, what are you talking about? You should be rich. So when I went back home to Nigeria, I told people they couldn't believe me. So it is not country specific. Everywhere you find go, you might find poor people there. And so what can we do? as young people, as part of our civic engagement? That is a question for us. And COVID-19 pandemic, 
that is another thing that we are all dealing with. Either you live in America or you live elsewhere. There is no place to escape. So we need to find a way around that. And, and what you can do as a young person could be education. If you don't have money to contribute, it could be education, it could be sensitizing people on how to, to be safe out there. So that could be one of, one of the things that we can do um, and others. And I think I would like you to check out the Millennium Project. Uh, you can Google that and Transformation Map by the World Economic Forum. They have different issues, different things, uh, topics that we can engage in as, I mean, at the moment, and some of the global issues and where young people can also be, uh, be engaged or participate to solve some of those problems. We can go to the next slide, sir. Yeah, just a couple of minutes left. Yes. Okay. I'll be fast. So, <laughs> and, and so in my idea, um, interestingly, my dissertation is on uh, civic engagement. So one of the things, I'm sure you are familiar with this, you might think, oh, those are very big problems. No, so yeah, they are, but what can you do as a young person? You can write a letter to your representative in government. You can raise money for your food pantry. You don't need to travel abroad, right here with her. There could be need in your communities that you can also be part of. So you can protest. But when you go out there to protest, please do not destroy anyone's business uh, and do not harass anyone, but let make your uh, agitation or your grievances known in a peaceful manner. And you can serve, engage in your community and church, etc., uh, etc. So we can go to the next slide. I think I'm almost done. And uh, so I brought this idea of uh, these a uh, teenager who has been in the news about, about the environment. So this is just to show you that don't think you are, cannot be, uh, and you cannot engage. There are opportunities for you as young people to engage, to interact with others. And so we can go back to the video to, because of, <laughs> I think I still have little time. So, Doug, am I seeing the video okay? No video? No, vi no video. <laughs> no video yet. No, just your screen. Your background. All right. Let me try it again. Uh, and, okay. How about now? Yeah. yeah. So we can see now. You can play now. Here we go. Yeah, I'll be back, I promise you. One year is too long. See, it's abroad too. Let me just go. I promise you I'll be back. One year. Promise. I promise you. You know I love you. I love you too. One year. Ah! You are dead! <laughs> Bounce. My mansion on 
on a madam, make you take a look around. What are the brakes say I do? Say, I am. Go tell your papa, say that me, they come for you. So, uh, can I go on? Yes, go finish up and yeah. Okay, so I showed that video for one reason because we're talking about Nigeria. And I thought, like, uh, when you look at the popular culture as a way to represent or to change a culture in a little bit. And in that video, I can quickly give you the synopsis. Uh, the young man was poor and he traveled abroad after five years. Now he's coming back home. He can, he can now afford to buy a jet and expensive cars. And this guy will go back to the man who chased him away with a, with a machete. And, and the man will be like, oh, you made it. So now you can marry my daughter. So let's go do the wedding. And so in a way, that's to tell you how the culture is changing and the idea of materialism uh, is not only in America, so in that video, though there are not a lot of pro profanities there, but the whole idea is I made it. I have money and I can buy the wife right now. So, and that's common. Anywhere you look, you see that prevalent. So it's not only in the US that you see that, you can see also that in other countries. And also the popular culture also as well is changing everyday culture because everything now is built around money. So if you have money and wealth and everything, you might be able to get a very beautiful woman in town. But if you don't have that, probably you should go elsewhere. Uh, this place is not for you. So it's just to familiarize you with what you might encounter in that context. But the most important thing about my uh, speaking with you this morning is to think about some of the problems that we have around the world and how you can engage as young people in your own little way. It could be creating a website, it could be uh, helping young person around you to write a letter or something that can improve people's lives in your local community and also internationally. Thank you for listening. You might have questions. All right. Thank you, Adagoki, very much. As always, a very, very interesting presentation that um, I think has really challenged some folks, and that's good. We want to do that. We want to continue to be able to think about that. Uh, we'll invite the students. So we've got quite time for questions at the end of this section. So if you have thought something for Adagoki, please go ahead and share that in the chat, and we can get those asked. But I'm going to turn it over now to Amanda to let her start with her presentation. And so, Amanda, you're up. Thank you again. So again, my name is Amanda and I live in Tippecanoe. I work on campus, but originally I'm from Oklahoma and I graduated with a bachelor's and master's from Oklahoma State University. Um, so I work in the international program in agriculture department and I am also 50% um, in that time and 50% in the extension um, I don't want to call it a department, but uh, it kind of is a department. So anyways, both of my time is my split. My time is split between those two. So when I was in college, um, I had never heard of Peace Corps and I was taking an ag education class and my uh, professor was a return Peace Corps volunteer. And she told us stories about her service, um, you know, the good and the bad and the ugly. And I was at a point in my life where I was super adventurous. I had just come back from an internship at Walt Disney World in Florida. And so when she talked about, you know, these adventures, um, she was in, I don't remember where she was, but in a country in Africa, um, that just kind of spoke to my soul. And so as I got my bachelor's, I decided to apply for the Peace Corps and I was placed in Paraguay. So whoever said they wanted to go to Paraguay, woohoo! I'm super excited for you. <laughs> uh, we'll advance on to the next slide. 
So in Peace Corps Paraguay, there are over 200 volunteers that are working there in a variety of ways. Um, they focus on agriculture, community economic development, the environment and health. And while Peace Corps volunteers are in Paraguay, they learn to speak actually two languages. Spanish and Guarani are the um, national languages and Guarani is um, like a native language. And so uh, you have to have a somewhat of a good base of Spanish in order to go into Paraguay because um, in the first three months of service, you are learning language. So you're learning Spanish from Spanish speakers. And then about halfway through the three months, you switch over to learning Guarani in Spanish. Um, so it's really challenging to learn a new language in a language that you don't really know. Um, and so that's, that's challenging. So they want you to have a base there in Spanish. And then talking about Peace Corps in general, there's over uh, 4,000 uh, uh, volunteers that have served in Paraguay since uh, 1966. So Peace Corps was started in, oh, Paul, you might have to help me in this, 61 or 62 uh, by John F. Kennedy, somewhere around in there, I don't remember. Um, and then because of COVID-19 uh, right now, they did a massive evacuation of all volunteers. So. They mobilized over 7,000 people to evacuate their countries. And then as the situation progresses and gets better, um, you know, then those volunteers will go back to their countries. Next slide, please. Oh, so first of all, uh, can we go back? Sorry. Uh, Peace, or Paraguay is in South America and I affectionately call it the armpit of South America. There are only two countries that do not have a, um, like a coastline in South America. And so I had the honor of going to one of those countries. So Paraguay is uh, right there kind of in the middle and Bolivia is the other country that does not have a coastline. And then I was in the department or what we would consider a state of Misiones and they're on the right hand and the upper right hand corner. That's that marked um, department there on the south, so I would, yep, yeah, right there. I was right on the border of Argentina, so uh, quite often we would go over to Argentina uh, for vacation. Next slide, please. So while I was there, I was an agriculture volunteer, so these were some of the things that I focused on. Um, as a Peace Corps volunteer, you also work outside of your agriculture realm. So really what you're doing is a needs assessment with your community and you're identifying what do they need, what do they want, and then you're providing it to them. So I worked, um, and Paul did too, we worked beyond just you know agriculture. I worked with youth and women as well. And so I wanna show you a couple of pictures and I'll describe those to you. Um, Paraguay is old school and so we didn't have tractors. Well, we had tractors but you had to have a lot of money in order to have uh, rent a tractor so we used oxen in order to till the ground and I had never seen oxen before so I'm a farm girl you know grew up around cattle but I've never seen oxen before and those things are massive. Uh, so this does not do any justice. That is not uh, an ox in there, but I just wanted to show that to you. Uh, next picture. Um, as Peace Corps volunteers, you do a lot of gardening and you work with your host families and other families in the communities to incorporate new vegetables into their diet. So in Paraguay, they eat a lot of um, onions, tomatoes, and lettuces, um, and that's that, and garlic, and really that's about it. So we tried to incorporate broccoli and cauliflower and kale and all sorts of other types of vegetables. So um, I was not a gardener. I didn't know how to garden. So Paraguay actually, Paraguayans taught me how to garden, and then I just kind of threw in some extra ideas on, you know, maybe how to do things. Next picture. Uh, nothing was easy in Paraguay and so this is a wheelbarrow and if you had to haul water this was one way that you could haul water uh, on your wheelbarrow. It worked, it was great, things fell off often though and that was uh, that was time consuming. <laughs> Next picture. Um, every household has small animals from um, you know maybe ducks and chickens, maybe a, one sheep, uh, maybe one or two pigs, and they are all free range. And so they just hang out around the house. You might feed them a little bit in the morning and then all day long they run around all over town and then they come back uh, in the evening time when you feed them again. 
sometimes the pigs would um, be tied to a tree because they didn't really free range very well. And so they had like a, a rope tied around their neck and then every day they would like change around trees uh, you know, to root around on vegetables and whatnot. I also had a pig and I did not show this picture, but I wanted to show um, my family that you could feed your pig, intentionally feed your pig, and it would grow bigger faster so that you could, um, you know, slaughter it and then have some, some food and whatnot. Um, and so this is another realm that we worked in quite often with small animal husbandry. Next slide. Um, curva de nivel in Spanish, which uh, means a curvy line in English. Um, if you have a slope, we know here in our practices that there are certain ways that you would want to plant on this slope to help with erosion. And so this was one method that we were teaching Paraguayans, you know, how to find the correct curvature on the slopes um, in order to um, plant and help with erosion. And these are not things that I knew ahead of time. Obviously, I'd, I'd never used an A-frame and was hand planting, you know, here in the States. So in this three month uh, training period when you're learning language, you're also learning these skills so that you can go out and do them in your work as well. Next picture. Um, so we don't have mechanized you know, tillage in Paraguay. So you learn how to use a hoe. And there are all different varieties of hoes, shapes and sizes. And um, so I became very adapted, um, you know, very experienced professional hoer. Um, and I, along the way, I killed many uh, cotton plants trying to learn how to use the hoe. I felt kind of bad for my family because that was their source of income, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm over it now. <laughs> Um, and then a large part of uh, Peace Corps is working with youth. And that's a variety of ways through youth camps, working in the schools. Um, almost, almost all Peace Corps volunteers do some type of uh, youth development. Next slide. Oh, yes. Oh, and then more gardening. Because I said, we, uh, we do a lot of gardening. Um, when I was there, um, elementary schools were mandated to have a school garden and that was a perfect opportunity for me as a Peace Corps volunteer to go in and work with youth and work with garden, a learn gardening myself, um, but then also learn right alongside with the kids. Next slide. Housing. Um, housing is very rustic and it looks very different. So we had um, this house, for example, had wood planks and then a thatch roof. Next picture. We had houses that had um, almost like a adobe style walls and then a tin roof. And um, sometimes there wasn't anything underneath this tin roof underneath your house or like inside your house. And so, you know, when it rained, it was quite loud. If you were underneath a mango tree, I mean, it was like bombs being dropped on your house. Um, also, in the summertime, it was scorching hot when it was 100 degrees and your house was a little oven. And so you had to really think about these things when you chose your house or built your house. Um, almost all volunteers had a hammock and all, almost all volunteers had a bicycle there on the right hand side. All houses have porches as well, so you can sit underneath there and drink your tea and whatnot. Um, as you can tell, it's pretty rustic, so we didn't have running water, which meant we also had outhouses. And so this picture here on the right is a picture of an outhouse. Um, this is about what my outhouse looked like, except that it had um, a, one more wall than what we had. Our outhouse only had three walls. Um, and so the wall that was open just kind of went into a, like a banana grove or, you know, forest or whatever. So nobody could really see you. Um, sometimes the outhouses were squatters. Sometimes they had something fashioned where you could sit. Um, sometimes you had toilet paper. Sometimes you did not. Sometimes you used alternative toilet paper. I learned all about alternative toilet paper, which includes uh, 
newspapers and corn cobs. Um, so, you know, you just kind of make do with what you got. I sometimes had my parents send me down some toilet paper so that I could have some. <laughs> uh, next one. So living conditions are, you know, pretty different in Paraguay um, because it's a poor country and we, we were pretty, we were very poor. We ate something called mandioca, or I believe in English it's yuca, and it's basically a root. Um, there's not a lot of nutritional value to it, really, it's just a filler. And families would eat maybe six kilos of that a day, uh, like a person would maybe eat that much. Again, there's not real, there's less nutritional value to it than a potato, and it was really just a filler. And it grew in all soil conditions. And so this is what um, mandioca looks like uh, when you pull it up out of the ground and then you peel it and boil it. Now, Paraguayans are pretty creative and so they made ways to make it super delicious. They put it like directly on the coals in the fire and I'm pretty sure we're all gonna get cancer from eating that coals, but um, that was pretty delicious with some salt on there. Uh, we also sprinkled in with like some fried eggs and some cheese and uh, mandio and that was, that was fabulous too. So this is kind of what cook prep looks like in Paraguay. Next picture. So we don't have a kitchen. And so you have an outdoor kitchen. Most times you're cooking over an open fire. And, but sometimes there on this very special occasion, you might want to make a cornbread or a cake or something. And so we have this outdoor oven and this is called a tataqua. And you might, it might look like a pizza oven that you see, and it's a similar thing, but except that they build a fire in there and they make it scorching hot. When the flame is blue, they sweep out all the coals in the wood and they stick their food in there. And then in, you know, 30 minutes or so it's cooked and then they bring it out uh, and it's done. These really were only used really for special holidays. Next. So here's the open fire that I mentioned um, that you cook on. Usually meals are in one pot. So we ate a lot of stews and um, a lot of stews. I'll just say that. Uh, we ate a lot of fried food and a lot of stews. And sometimes you could have like a little tripod thing that you could put your pan up on while it cooked and it wasn't just like directly in the fire. And you got a couple minutes left. Okay, good, I'll go faster. <clears throat> um, Washing clothes obviously might be challenging, so you do this by hand, and here's the bucket where she might wash her clothes, and then up on the fence back behind, um, you hang your laundry up to dry. Next picture. Almost everybody has to walk into their site. This is what your path looks like. You get off the bus and you walk for an hour, or you ride your bike into your site. Next picture. This is the main mode of transportation. Again, you use your oxen and your cart and away you go. Sometimes you use horses. Now they've upgraded and a lot of people have motorcycles and bicycles that they uh, transport on. So then a couple years later, I, graduated, I came back from Peace Corps and I graduated with my master's and I went totally the opposite in and I went and I lived in South Korea for a little bit. And if you can imagine, it was completely the opposite end of the spectrum from Paraguay. South America, or I mean, uh, South Korea is in Asia, right across from Japan. Um, you can go over there and teach English in a hagwon, which is an after school um, job. There's a public school and a university. So I worked as an after school job and at the university. Um, usually airfare and housing is paid for, health insurance and vacation benefits. Next. Um, and you can actually put a couple of these pictures up. I think I spaced those out. So um, obviously I taught uh, youth my first year and then my, in my second and third year, I worked at the university. And so you're doing a lot of hands-on activities, very similar to 4-H, really you're just doing a lot of activities so that you can um, help them practice using their English in sort of everyday activities. Lots of camps in, in uh, South Korea, they love youth camps. So we did a lot of youth camps. Next. Housing is majority, it's a one room. And so you enter in through the door there on the left, you take your shoes off, you come in, um, right across the, the room is your, your bed, very simple furnishings. Um, right there, uh, uh, there's a balcony out there and that A-frame thing is where you hang your clothes after you uh, wash them. Yep, 
And then that is my kitchen. So you have obviously running water and you have a, a refrigerator, a microwave and a two burner stove top, no oven. And then this is the bathroom. There was no separate shower, dedicated shower. So um, when you took a shower, everything got soaking wet in there. And so you had to make sure you took your toilet paper out of the room. And then um, that bidet there, the toilet, it was a heated seat. And that was the family deluxe model. So um, there were lots of whirly gigs and gadgets on that toilet seat that we play around with. Next. Life in Korea, we ate bugs. Those are mealworms. They're kind of nutty and delicious. This is what the beach looks like. Um, nobody wants to get a tan, and so generally nobody wants to get a tan, so everybody is underneath the, an umbrella on the beach. Um, we sit on the floor. As you can see on the far right, there's a couch, but nobody's sitting on the couch. We all like to sit on the floor, and uh, we have a community, and uh, we share food, and I have some food pictures on there. Buddhism is uh, the... Um, sort of majority religion and so lots of temples that we got to visit while we were there while i was there next picture and then again lots of community eating you don't have your plate you have a our plate with lots of little sides that you share with everybody so this is seoul um, they have big big cities and almost everyone lives in an apartment um, very rarely do you know of anyone who has their own house Next. And nightlife in Korea is amazing. You don't just look straight forward as you're walking down the street. You also look up the buildings because every floor has something. So this was a really popular street with lots of um, karaoke and bars and restaurants. Transportation is amazing in South Korea. Um, this is the bullet train. You could take this um, from Seoul down to Busan in the southern part uh, in just a couple of hours. They also have, um, you know, planes and trains and subways, buses, and then there was Wi-Fi everywhere. Free Wi-Fi everywhere. Excellent. So in the next slide. So in my current job now, while I don't necessarily live overseas, now I work in various countries and I help others go to other countries as well. So just a couple of projects that we have because I know I'm out of time. So Trinidad and Tobago, I send uh, people there to teach others how to do some things, so technical skills. Um, we have projects in Peru, China, Honduras, Colombia, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. Um, I also forgot Iraq. We have a, a project there too. And I'll stop there. Amanda, thank you. Lots mm -hmm. of great information. And let's try to transition right into Dr. Ebner. So Paul, here come your slides. And okay. there you go. Well, welcome. You can just go to right to the next slide. So my name is Paul Ebner. I'm a professor in animal sciences. And what I'm going to try and do in the next, next 15 minutes is show you how Purdue as a, as a university gets involved in these different projects throughout the world. So you're on 4-H, so you're part of an actual engagement or extension program with Purdue. These are projects that extend well beyond the counties, extend beyond the state and, and are, are um, located all throughout the world. So this is kind of what our, our main goal is. You know, they have huge food security problems throughout the world. Um, and we've seen with COVID-19 that our own food system is, is um, susceptible to major disruptions. But we know that those countries that have this, this good relationship between universities, government, and the private sector, they're all better positioned to, to respond to these big challenges. And that's what a lot of what we do is try to foster those relationships, build them, to where they're meaningful and they produce uh, high quality results. So go ahead. Okay, so the first place we're gonna go is Afghanistan. So I'll talk about different projects that I've been involved with just because I know them the best. And these are sheep in Afghanistan. And I was not familiar with these types of sheep, even though I am an animal scientist, but these are fat tailed sheep and they're everywhere. Um, and it was just really, at first they were just really amusing to me, but um, that, that's just a huge big fat pad on their, on their backside. So Afghanistan, uh, you're 
probably familiar with it. We've, we've had troops as, in Afghanistan since 2001. Um, and it's been a country that even prior to the current troubles was rocked by conflict. Um, it destroyed economies, it destroyed communities. And right now, most people hold that the key to that, that country really, really coming back and being, being stable both economically and, and, and security wise is agriculture. Um, and what we've tried to do with, in Afghanistan is work with Afghan partners to build the education systems that will produce the people that can make those changes. So we're really looking at trying to come up with different education programs that produce students that when they graduate, they're ready to make an immediate impact. So one of the, one of the projects that we did that we're very proud of is working with food uh, technology. So Afghanistan produces a whole bunch of different great raw materials from mangoes to wheat to milk and there's capacity for value-added products, like processed products, but there's very little expertise in the economy. So what we try to do is create this new uh, BS level department. So it's like an, a new major, a new academic department uh, focused on food technology. We brought, try and bring in, you know, not only the academics, but the government regulators and also the private sector, people who might hire these students to really make a program that is highly relevant to what's needed in the community. So the bottom is some pictures of those students um, uh, doing different laboratory projects. Um, we're proud that the first class enrolled in 2016 and then they graduated in 2018. And this year is a little bit different because of COVID, um, but they've had successful uh, uh, graduating classes since then and those students are finding jobs in in places like large milk processors or labs that are doing quality testing and things like that so we're very proud of that program okay okay this is the map of the world and we're going to the second star which the first star on the right is afghanistan the one on the left is and the background gives you a hint that's egypt so go ahead Okay, if you're not familiar with Egypt, it's in the very northeast part of Africa. It is extremely dry, um, it is extremely populated, and it faces huge, huge food security issues, especially with changing climate. So this project is a part of a larger project that is aiming to Trans, try and help transform these Egyptian universities to where they produce research that can tackle these problems, students that can tackle them, and those relationships between, like I said, the government, uh, the private sector, and the universities to come up with solutions that really, really work. So go ahead. So here's something that is, for me, is absolutely shocking. So unemployment in Egypt is 14%. That's pre-COVID numbers. Now with our employment numbers, unemployment numbers in the United States, they're actually about 14%. But they're usually about three and a half to 4%. All that aside, unemployment among college graduates is 30%, which should be pretty shocking. And what that means is really, if you get a college degree, you have a less chance of getting a job. And what that means really is what employers think is that what, what's happening in the university, it's, it's, it's of no value to us. Um, the people that are coming out of the university, they don't have the skills that we want. They're not teaching, they're not learning what we need them to learn in college. We just rather hire our cousin or whomever. So next slide. So with this project, our goal, and these projects are always in partnerships with the host country um, individuals or groups, but we're trying to create university programs that, that develop workforce ready students. And those are students that have the skills that employers tell us they want. 
Um, and these students are ready to start right away and be effective in these uh, entry level jobs and professional jobs in agriculture or even start their own businesses. So go ahead. So what that means is this is a, these are five year projects, but it means creating you know, new degrees. So we're creating new, de new degree in, in animal sciences. These are very hands-on degrees where students learn real skills. They're um, going outside of the classroom uh, from traditional lecture format. Um, they're doing internships um, to get real life experiences. We're doing the same thing with creating new master's degrees that are, are targeted very much to an emerging issue in Egypt, whether that is uh, protected horticulture, um, poultry production is uh, a huge growing, and this is always amazing to me in countries like Egypt, so hot, so dry, and, uh, and their poultry industry is, is really growing. Um, it's revising old courses, but as important, it's working with um, Egyptian faculty, professors, um, to, to get everyone up to speed, to get uh, everyone the capacity to deliver these new programs. So we have Egyptians coming here. We have a lot of Americans going to Egypt, um, all part of that partnership between these two countries. Go ahead. Okay, click. Oh, it's, are you found the PDF? Okay, click again. Okay, so we're going back east and we're gonna go to Pakistan. Go ahead. Speaking of chicken, chicken is huge in Pakistan. It's uh, 40 to 45% of the meat produced in Pakistan is poultry. And this is really amazing. And you can look up how much agriculture as a whole contributes to the US GDP. And you'll be surprised at how low it is. But in, in Pakistan, poultry production alone produces 1.2% of their GDPs. So 1.2% of the money, um, the income or the revenue in, in Pakistan is from chicken. So it also provides 1.5 million jobs. So that's, it's, it's a really, really important key um, uh, industry. And what it doesn't say here is, is Pakistan is a protein deficient country. So starch, no problem, milk sugars, um, but there are communities throughout Pakistan that, that don't have access to high quality protein. Chicken produces a readily affordable and very, very high quality protein source for those communities. Go ahead. So this project is again, working directly with the host country partners but Pakistan is similar to the United States in that this is a, this is a production system in, in Pakistan. Um, it's a little bit more open than you'd see in the United States, but you see that they're very big. Um, they're very, they use precise nutrition, just like us. And they also use different uh, management practices. And one of those practices that is being phased out, just as it is in the United States, is using antibiotics for performance in those chickens. So this is using antibiotics to um, improve growth rate or uh, improve feed efficiency. So when that happens, when you withdraw those antibiotics, there's big problems usually, other diseases pop up. So what this project is working with Pakistani labs and our lab here in the United States, to kind of develop, to try and develop those technologies that can limit the spread of pathogens and bacteria, or pathogenic bacteria in chicken but without the use of antibiotics. So then in many ways, there are alternatives to antibiotics. So what's important for these types of projects is, is we try and come up with a technology. That's one thing, you can come up with a technology, but if no one ever used that technology, all your work never existed. So we partner with economists that look at, you know, what types of technologies would actually be adopted? You know, what's the scenario where uh, someone will accept this technology and what and they'll pay for it. They're called studies called like willingness to pay or willingness to adopt. 
So we use that information to then inform the kind of technologies that we're looking at. So we don't end up with something that is wonderful in the lab. It's great. No one will ever, ever use it. It's either too expensive or too cumbersome or people are just freaked out by it for some reason. So we really, really are focused on coming up with technologies that we know have a great, a, a, a very high likelihood of actually being implemented in the field. Go ahead. Okay, so we went, started in Afghanistan, we went to Egypt, we went back over to Pakistan, Afghanistan's neighbor. And the last one I'll talk about is a new project at, at Purdue. It's a, what they call the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Food Safety. So these, the, the name is a little bit confusing because it's not a brick and mortar, it's not a building, but this is the lab, this is the Food Safety Innovation Lab. So these food safety innovation labs are really um, big, big research projects that are directed by US universities that have a different theme. So there's an innovation lab for horticulture, there's an innovation lab for post-harvest processing. So Purdue was awarded the innovation lab for food safety. And what that means is that Purdue's in charge of identifying big challenges in food safety, and then also working with um, the different countries to um, address those challenges. And part of that is, is you know, making, uh, or, uh, making technologies, but a big part of that is building labs and building resources so these countries can then address any future food safety issue. So this project is focused in five different countries. So Cambodia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Senegal and Bangladesh. And it's just started. Um, my part is in Cambodia. I, before this project, I'd never worked in Cambodia. I think it, it's probably one of my top, it's definitely one of my top three places to work. It's a wonderful place. People are wonderful. Um, it's really, really hot, really hot. <laughs> but uh, food's great and, it, and, and, it's, and it's just an easy uh, environment to operate in. So I'm really grateful for that project. You can go to the next one. Okay, so like Amanda, I was in the Peace Corps um, in this, and I was actually in Paraguay too. And, and that's really rare to run into someone else that's in Paraguay. Uh, I put these pictures on because it's easy to get involved in this stuff. It, sometimes it seems daunting. Um, it's far away. Um, it's too much time. Like Peace Corps is almost two and a half years long. Now I remember being that age, I was like, wow, that's, that's forever. <laughs> um, I put the picture on the left. I think I like that picture because I really actually wear the same clothes 25 years later, which is a little bit embarrassing, but that's fine. And the one on the right, I'm gonna let Amanda, I've, Amanda's never seen this picture, but I think she can guess what's happening in this picture. Do you have PK? Yes. <laughs> so um, one of the things that's really common when Pete's going Paraguay is you get these, you'd wake up and it'd feel like you stubbed your toe and you look down and there'd be this little black dot. And it was actually some sort of bug or worm or whatever. And it, and it laid a little, it laid eggs. And it had this little sack of eggs inside your toe. And uh, I put this picture on for a couple of reasons. One, I was awesome at getting, they're called PKs. I was great at getting PKs. I got them all the time. <laughs> and the woman who's operating on my foot without a medical license, don't worry about it, um, is uh, another Peace Corps volunteer who I still am in contact with. She was really, really great at getting these um, uh, PKs out of your foot. Because you had to get them out where you didn't disrupt the sack, because then it was just disgusting. It's already disgusting, but it gets worse. Um, and then the funny thing about this picture is the, um, the woman in the upper left, Elise, is, uh, is this whole thing's going on and she could care less. And I put this on because things might seem daunting. Humans are extremely resilient, highly adaptable. Um, so you, you learn to roll with the punches and you learn to, you know, say this is the situation we're in, how can we work best in this situation? So I would encourage anyone, if you have any sort of inkling, any sort of opportunity, 
you get into and you get into this type of work. I think the a good step is first good step study abroad when you're in college. Um, if that's not feasible, uh, the next best step, or it actually is the is the first best step, but to join the Peace Corps. Um, you know, I've been to I've gone to different colleges. I work at a college. Um, Peace Corps is probably the only thing that I would recommend to anyone to do it. No questions asked. Just just do it, and um, and and you'll 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 be very very thankful that you did. Next up, this is just my NASCAR picture. I guess it's all the people, different groups that sponsor the research and programs. Um, most times we're uh, a, we're, we're contract um, contracted to put these up, but these are very generous um, donors. Um, it comes the the funding from the project comes from the U.S. government. It also comes from uh, similar agencies in the UK, uh, comes from similar agencies in Canada. And these are all agencies that are looking to build capacity and resilience in communities throughout the world. That's all I got. Well, thank you, Dr. Ebner. Thank you, Adagoki and Amanda. We have about two minutes for questions and that's awesome because it, it, you guys shared so many great really good things one question that came in a little bit earlier was about the pay that you might receive in the peace corps uh, you, that. you go ahead paul you're more recent so you might have better numbers uh i mean so if you want like straight numbers you make about a hundred dollars a month so you make you get money you receive a stipend but it's um, equivalent to what um, the people that you live with what they are making and so um, you are really integrating into the culture and into the community with which you live so you're making sort of the same amount of money that your neighbors are um, peace Corps gives you a little bit extra um, you know so that you you kind of you know feel a little bit more secure but hundred dollars a month is definitely enough to uh, buy food and you know go to the capital to check your mail and you know have a cell phone and those types of things so every every country is different it all depends on you know what the average income is a question uh, has also come in how do we balance helping other countries with supporting the local u.s farmer I think that's a fair question. Um, there's a couple things at play. Uh, if you look at balance, I'm in a department with 35 professors and I'm the only professor that does these types of projects. So there's, there's a lot of attention very geared towards US farming. Um, one of the things to think about is that these projects aren't, they're not only to just help these farmers they're also in the united states interest in terms of national security and they're often billed as such because we often go to places um where you know they're almost failed states you know a failed state is a place where a government just is not functioning anymore when that happens there's huge strife there's huge conflict so not having food is one thing but a civil war is huge so most people feel that you know a key to stability in in that country and 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 its outward actions is is to uh have opportunities for people so and this is also what you would hear a lot of times from um, national security people you know and saying like we can't do the, the army um or the armed forces can't do what they want to do without this component where, you know, we're helping these, these communities or uh, uh, countries become economically stable and feeding people. But it is a fair question. It is always a balance. And the good thing, though, is that um, this is all uh, public information. So you can look up, if you, you can take time and look up budgets, see how much goes where and, and who gets what. I'd like to add on to that. <clears throat> so by helping other countries develop strong economies, we then as the United States can trade with those economies. We as Americans like a wide variety of products from around the world. And so by building up other countries, that allows you know, those products from them to come to us. 
It also helps our local farmer because if you have a strong economy, um, let's say in Trinidad and Tobago, that means they have more money to purchase our products that our farmers are growing. So it helps with international trade. Next question, if college grads uh, there, and I assume this is referring to Egypt, are having difficulty getting jobs, do they want Americans there helping? Are we really helping? Um, that's a fair question too. So we're not hiring them. What we, how we do this is the first thing we do is we, we know that there's a gap. There's a gap in the skills that the students have and there's a gap in the skills that employers want. To find that out takes research. And it's the same type of research that you would do to develop a technology. It means methodically collecting information, quantitatively assessing it to really identify what those gaps are. So when, what we then do is take that and we can create, create curriculum or create the resources that bridge those gaps with those students. The second thing is we, and this is not, you know, in the United States, we take it for granted that all these different people are involved in the university. You know, you have private sector, you have big businesses, small businesses, you have government support. Well, a lot of these universities don't have that. They have no connection with, with their private sector. They have no connection with who's hiring their students later. So a big part of what we always do is try and bring that sector into the education programs so they can give input in how the curriculum is developed. They can give input they can use some of their resources to provide different um, uh, experiences to students like internships, short-term research, because these are all shown, this is research-based, they're all determinants on in, for employment for that student. You know, you can look at an Egyptian student and you can name five things that will increase their employability. It's very pretty easy. You just have to provide the, the, the resources or the environment that allows those, those students to get those experiences. Right now, they're just not getting them. So there's no value. The return on investment of a university degree in Egypt, in some cases, is very low. And the last question that we're going to move on to a, a quick break is, when do you recommend joining the Peace Corps? So, <laughs> Amanda can chime in. You generally have to have a four-year degree um, or you have to have a lot of uh, really unique experience, say like you, you work construction for a long time and you, you know, or you've been a, a, a farm owner for a long time, things like that. Um, so generally out of college, um, but there's no, there's no bad time to join. I mean, in high school, you're, you're too early, but you need a degree first, but after that, anytime. Yeah, there's no real, you know, best time to join, but most people join right out of their bachelors. But you can go as a married couple, you can wait, uh, you just you can't have any kids while you're in the Peace Corps. So, Adagoki, I want to give you a chance to give a final comment because we didn't have a direct question for you. So what would you like to share with us as we wrap up today? Um, when I was, thank you for that opportunity. When I was talking, I didn't mention I, I did Fulbright. Um, I came to the state to do Fulbright and I think Fulbright also is another opportunity for you to go into other countries to teach English. And, and like Dr. Paul said and Amanda, so most of what America is doing is not to give people money like that. The idea, everything is tied into national security. Uh, for instance, if America is helping Nigeria to build strong economy, the whole idea for me in a simple way would be if young people can get jobs in their countries, they wouldn't need to move en masse to America. They can stay and prosper in their countries. So everything is tied to what America is going to benefit in the long run. Thank you. 
No, thank you. And I, I want to thank the three panelists. Uh, we always run over, but it's always good information and really appreciate it. Agoki and Amanda and Paul for you being with us this morning. Uh, thank you for the great information. Uh, students, so that you know, I know there's more questions out there, but so that you know, if you have questions you can still ask, we can get those questions to our three panelists and I know we'll get responses back. We'll also have their PowerPoint slides and the links that have been shared to some of the videos and some of the other resources. I will post those on our civic engagement uh, workshop webpage so you can look at those too and there's all kinds of more information that we can learn always so uh, thank you three panelists we really appreciate you being with us again this morning um, this was supposed to be a five minute break we're going to make it a three minute and 16 break because that's where it actually showed up so at 10 26 we are going to come back and Natasha is ready for us and we will be uh, able to to hear her fantastic presentation in about three minutes so thank you so much and we'll see you very soon all right, welcome back everyone. Natasha Harris has joined us and we are so excited that, that she is a part of our program again this year. Uh, she has done a tremendous job presenting the last couple of years and so now she's kind of a, a standby. We always have her. We're, we're really thrilled that she can be with us uh, this morning as an outstanding presentation. And Natasha, let me get up here and give you the remote control. And I think you now have a, a permission opportunity to accept you're controlling my screen. There you go. Yep, I got it. Thank you for that. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited to virtually see you all <laughs> here. I enjoy doing these presentations because anytime I can talk or have a discussion about how to interact with other people, it is a joy to me, which is very funny because I am an, a severe introvert and engaging with people is terrifying. But <laughs> one of the things that I do enjoy is showing other people how to get along and how that being different is not that bad. It's just something that we can appreciate and we can love and it keeps us interesting. So we're going on. So Steve told me I have permission to ask you to unmute yourself. I'm not gonna ask everybody to respond, but I do have a few questions just to kind of get to know each other. So I pulled out my trusty little icebreaker thing. And so I'm gonna ask a question. And if one or two of you want to answer, please just unmic yourself and just go for it, okay? So the first question is, who is the most famous person you ever met? It could be movie, actor, YouTube, social media. Who is the most famous person you ever met? I don't know if anybody's on mute. Um, Purdue President, President Obama. Who? Um, I met President Obama. What? I, see, now I'm, a, I'm jealous. Now, who is this who met President Obama? Kiara Beatty. And how are you? Good. Good. <laughs> okay, anybody else want to respond? I don't know who you could top, you know, President Obama, but anybody else want to try? <laughs> they had to set the bar pretty high there. <laughs> yes. You know, my best shot was Mitch Daniels. Yep, that is, that is a great one. I met him in person when I got my degree from Purdue, so I was excited about that. He's still working here. Okay, so next question. This is a long one. If you won a contest in which your prize was to select any three guests to appear on a popular late night talk show, whatever talk show you like, which three people would you choose? Who would you choose if you were able to be on a talk show? Now, one of the great things about Zoom is when I'm looking at the participant list, it has names on there. So I can just say, I don't know, is it Josiah? Yeah. Yeah. Who, what, who would you take? Oh, gosh. I'm very bad <laughs> with names. Um, Late night talk show. Any talk show you want. Any talk show you like. Um, I'm usually in bed by the time they come in, so I don't know 
who's out there? Ben Shapiro, Tammy Bruce, and Matt Walsh. And who are those individuals? Uh, political commentary. Com uh, political commentary. Com yeah, that's easy. Okay. All right, great. Just two more questions. So this one is because I know that you are studying a little bit about the government. If you could change one and only one aspect of the U.S. presidential election process, what would it be? Only one. No electoral college. Yes, I completely agree with that. And for those, can you explain what the electoral college is? The electoral college is um, basically uh, the group of people that do the voting for a state. So um, in the electoral college, um, each state has a certain amount of electoral votes and those are determined by um, the popular vote. Uh, so the president is not actually elected by the popular vote. It is um, a matter of who gets the most electoral votes. So in theory, um, this is what happened in the previous election, uh, President Trump did not win the uh, popular vote. Uh, Hillary Clinton did that, but Donald Trump secured the um, election because he won the electoral college vote. Correct. Very good. Look at you, Michael. I'm so proud of you. See, Steve, all of you guys, look how great job you're doing. Okay, last question. When people find out, now this is something that you have to think about in the future. When people find out what you do for a living, so think about what it is you want to do um, when you grow up, or I'm still trying to figure that out myself, what is the most typical question that you think you are likely to get from individuals? So when you grow up, what are some of the questions or what is one of the questions that you think you may get because of that job? Why did you choose that? <laughs> that is true. Why did you choose that? And what kind of career are you looking into? Um, law. Law? In particular law? Not sure yet. That is completely understand. There's so many, there's different law things that I don't even know about. How about Juliet? Or is it Juliet? Any response? Or from Tatiana? I hope I said that correctly. You just have to unmute yourself. Does anybody else want to answer the question? I know the one question that I get all the time when people hear that I am in diversity, they're just like, what, what do you do? You know? You just talk to people about how to get along? Yes, <laughs> pretty much. So, okay, so we're- Natasha, on. I've got yes. one. I Go think ahead. for most of our 4-H educators in the state, I think we get the question, what do you do the ele other 11 months of the year besides the fair month? <laughs> that is true. And by you the know, way, there's lots. <laughs> exactly. Well, you got to get to fair month. You know, everything yes. just doesn't pop up out of the ground, you know, already in full bloom or fully grown, um, go forth. But that is very interesting. So we are going to, uh -oh. okay, there we are. I went backwards. Okay, so there we are. So what we're going to talk about is how to get along with others when you're working in groups because when you are going to you are going to be working in teams with people who are like you who are different than you who may have different interests than you do and so how are we going to be able to work and understand so that we're able to accomplish our goals so during this session i want you to know that this is a safe place i want you to be encouraged to ask 
those questions that you may not typically want to ask. Trust me, I do not easily get offended unless you're talking about barbecue sauce from North Carolina, which one is best, then we, we may have to have a throwdown about that. But other than that, typically nothing else offends me. Um, we're only going to tell the truth. This is not a situation where we're going to embarrass anybody or look to be embarrassed. So don't worry about it. Whenever people say, oh, there are no such thing as dumb questions, you're correct. There's no such things because you don't know what you don't know until you know what it is that you don't know, right? Say that five times really fast. So this is going to be a learning, but we're also going to have some fun. And if you have questions throughout the presentation, and I am, just to give you a heads up, going to ask for some feedback. So just be prepared for that. And then what happens or says in this virtual room of ours will stay. Even though it is being recorded, <laughs> it is not for the purpose of sending to any college admission site and say, oh, guess what so-and-so said, or guess what they did. That is not the purpose of that. So, uh-oh, there we go. Oh, no. Okay, Steve, I think I'm getting... Go back. Give me one sec. Up. Oh, there we go. Stay there. Okay. Good. So, the purpose of this workshop is to be able to give you some foundations, some tools, and techniques to how to interact with other people, other individuals, either your peers, somebody of authority, or someone who is just curious about what it is that you're doing in your area. Um, they also provide you with the ability to complete tasks, to include how to work with another person or in a group, because sometimes when you're working one-on-one, -on -one, it's a lot different than when you're working with a group because now you have multiple people who you're trying to take into consideration, their feelings, their thoughts, their ideas, versus on one-on-one -on -one where you can just hash things out and then everybody goes and completes whatever it needs to be completed. Um, understanding and working within a group's culture. Now, when we're talking about culture, we're not only just talking about race and ethnicity, you know, Blacks, Whites, Indians, Asians, um, Native Americans, Hispanic, we're not talking about that, but culture is basically how you were raised. What is the, what are the priorities in your life, the traditions, the foundations, the morals that you have growing up that influence you as, and will be as an adult and moving forward. So some of our learning outcomes is basically how to manipulate, how to seek information and share I want you to be able to take away some direct versus indirect communication styles. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about verbal versus nonverbal. So, you know, body language. Um, and then also teach you how to be curious without being intrusive. How many of us love when somebody comes to us and we're just being bombarded with questions, like 30 questions in a row about what do you do? When were you born? How do you do this? How do you do that? And how much money do your parents make? How, you know, where were you raised? Do you brush your teeth every day? You know, a lot of times we don't want to hear a lot of this stuff. We want to be able just to have a natural conversation and be able to get to know someone in a non-intrusive way. Okay, so when we're looking at communication barriers, there are a lot of things that can lead to either a barrier, meaning that people are not completely understanding what we are trying to say, versus how we are perceived with other people. So for example, when we're talking about misread body language, whenever, I am a cold nature person, born in the South where it is 110 degrees before 6 a.m. And so coming here when individuals turn on air conditions, it's a little cold to me. And so I will cross my arms and I'm constantly doing this, not because I am irritated with whoever is leading the meeting, which I may be, but that's not the reason, but I'm not being um, 
what is the word, you know, kind of like rushing them along or being, you know, kind of like standoffish, it's because I'm cold. But when you have somebody and they have their arms crossed, you may think like, oh, does she have a problem with me? Is she a little bit, you know, anxious or she's trying to get away, you know, from me or having those conversations? So we want to be careful that we are not misreading body language. And if we have a question, you know, like I'm crossing my arms, like, oh, are you okay? You know, is there anything? And give me the opportunity to say, oh, it's just really cold in here because the air condition is on or something. And we can avoid a lot of bad energy, if you will, or bad vibes going on. So again, other barriers to communication can include language, language barrier. There are some things that are said in American culture that may not translate well in people from different cu cultures or different ethnic backgrounds. Um, one of the things that I enjoy doing is whenever people are using nonverbal language, like sign language um, for those that you know, people like, oh, yay, okay. To us, that means okay. In other languages and other cultures, it does not mean that. One can be very offensive. Well, all the other ones can be very offensive. And so that's one of the things that we want to make sure is that what we're communicating is stressing exactly what it is that we want to communicate versus what's perceived by a different area. We want to make sure that we maintain a distance. And when I mean distance, it's not just socially distance of that we're saying, but we want to make sure that we don't go too close in to personal information beside, until they are ready to share that. So for instance, I'm not going to go to Steve or to Dan and say, oh, 4-H, what is your annual salary? You know, that may be a little bit too much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that may be a little bit too much. So I just like, oh, that's interesting. What do you do? How do you go about that? You know, there's different aspects in what you're doing in your field. What's kind of the average salary range for those going in and versus those going out? So I want to make sure that I'm not crossing the line. And then, of course, you have disability. Um, one of the big things now that we have to wear face masks is what about those individuals who are hard of hearing and who read lips? When we're wearing, you know, full face masks like this, and there's an individual who needs to read my lips, it's going to be very hard for them to see exactly what it is that I'm saying. So we just want to be very cautious of that. Are there any questions? And I'm going to ask if you monitor the chat box because I'm kind of going back. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to have a quick video. And just to let you know, we will be sharing about this video. So just be prepared for it. English there. Oh, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> where? Hi there. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. I, uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean. But I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. Yeah. Ham Shasina. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place near my apartment. So I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm just American. Really? You're Native American? No, uh, just regular American. Oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well... Hello, Gamdok! What's all this then? Top of the morning to you. Let's get a small tea, small tea! Double, double, toil and trouble! Mind the gap! 
Beware, Jack the Ripper! Bloody hell! Pip pip! Cheerio! I think your people's fish and chips are amazing. You're weird. <laughs> really? I'm weird? Must be a crane thing. All right. So, what do we think about that video? Anybody? I think that we should treat people the way we should be treated, want to be treated. In the case of that guy was asking about where that lady was from, meaning like she looks Asian. Uh -huh. And then when she asked where he was from and acted all crazy like that, he thought she, he thought she was weird when right. he essentially did the same thing to her. Correct. But with him, it was, you're being weird. But when he was doing that to her, it was kind of like of his norm. What about somebody else? What do you think about the video? Anybody feedback? I don't know if there's anything in the chat. I had one in the chat that said it was cute and current. Okay. <laughs> and the person who put cute and current, what do you mean by current? I mean that typical people usually do that. Mm -hmm. And so the thing about it is I work in diversity work. I should know better, but I'm human just like everybody else. Just because I work in diversity does not mean that I do not make some of those faux pas um, like everybody else does. And that's okay for everybody to make, oops, a slip, I didn't mean to. When I work in diversity, that just means that I'm able to recognize it in myself a little bit sooner than maybe somebody else who may not deal with this in their world on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'm like, oh, I made a really big stink bomb. I need to recognize that, apologize if it may have been offensive, and, and move forward. So for example, I made a comment. Um, I was doing a presentation for a group of high school students like you guys. And I made a comment about somebody saying something about, you know, getting hit about it. Not that I'm promoting violence. I am not doing that. But, you know, doing that. And what I didn't realize was that one of the individuals in the room had a deformity on his right arm. And so making that kind of that physical comment about, oh, you come to me, we're going to have to go boxing. Well, looking at him with his deformity, even though he didn't bring it out, that could have been offensive to him because he does not have use or full use of that right arm. So I had to recognize like, okay, you made a, a flop, let's correct that and, you know, kind of like state what you mean and go what the analogy or whatever I was trying to communicate at that time for. So that's one of the things that we have to recognize and that leads into uh-oh. Okay, it's coming. So, okay, so this is, this does not like me. Okay, so that's where we go into core intercultural competencies. So these are three things um, that some of the top intercultural um, specialists or people who study interculture, you know, basically the relationship between different cultures and how we engage. This is th these are three things that they are saying that in order to communicate and to work effectively, this should be at the foundation. 
Now, just like an iceberg, you have the tip of the iceberg that's probably only a tenth of the entire iceberg right now. But this leans into some of the foundation of what we need to be able to express. So when we're thinking about cognitive um, complexity, we're thinking about looking and analyzing the situation. So just like I gave the example of me making a comment and then realizing after I made that comment that there's a student there who had a physical disability with one of his arms, I need to be able to interpret an event and look and make those differences around. Some people may be a little bit hard of hearing, so I make sure that I am very amplified um, when I'm speaking, unless somebody's like, okay, shh, calm down, you know, do that, which happens. And the funny thing is, I've had to work at home just like everybody else across the country. And I have my sliding glass door open because I love fresh air, just like I have the window open in my office now. And I know my neighbors think that I am crazy because I am basically yelling and they can hear my whole conversation just because I wanna make sure that the person on the other side of the video chat or on the phone call that I'm talking can hear me clearly and that there's no miscommunication. So I have to interpret that and then like, okay, let me go close my door, you know, turn on a fan, let me do this while I am doing that. So I'm looking to interpret the situation that is around me. Um, it's the same thing whenever students, when you have conversations with your parents, with people in the 4-H program, or with teachers, you do not talk to them the same way that you talk to your friends. When you talk to your friends, and I'm guilty of doing this, it's like a foreign language all of its own. You know, you're trying to, you use using slang, you're using this, and I'm now at the age where I'm like, what does that mean? What does, what is this emoji? And I'm like, okay, I'm getting old now that I got to ask a student to interpret um, something, something that somebody said. So we have to look at those different types of interpretations of how we communicate. When we're looking at empathy, empathy is a little bit different than sympathy, S-Y-M, sympathy versus empathy. Does anybody want to give a shot about what the difference between the two is? Sympathy, isn't sympathy like feel like showing that you kind of feel bad for them? And Say so that again? Isn't sympathy like you showing that you kind of feel bad for them? That's empathy. Mm -hmm. So that yes, we are, you know, taking somebody's feelings into consideration and we do feel bad. Um, sympathy is the same thing. You're right along those same lines, except it's something that we have experienced ourselves, and we know what the other person is going through because we have gone through the same thing. Um, I just had a student recently who told me that she lost her mother in April and how all of that was feeling. So I was able to sympathize with her because I lost my father um, a two, three years ago. And so I'm able to share that same pain, sense of loss with her. When I empathize with her, just like you were saying, it could be something along, um, somebody was doing a trick and they fell and they broke their ankle. I probably, well, I did break my ankle, but if you never broken a bone, you can empathize the pain that they may be feeling and wanting to help them because you feel bad that they are having to walk around on the past and use crutches. So when we're using empathy, we are able to take someone else's perspective and to understand it without judgment. That's the key here, without judgment. So to explain a little bit more, if I empathize, and this is gonna be a, a sensitive topic, so if you have problems, just let me know. Um, if somebody is in a domestic abuse situation and you hear about that on TV and on the radio and you see videos, the thing about it is, is that if a male or a man, you know, strikes a woman, a female, and you may feel bad, you will feel empathy 
for her, talking about, oh, he should have never done that. I feel bad for her having to live in that situation um, and so forth. So you empathize with her. The thing that we want to focus on is without the judgment piece. Because the thing about it is, and you probably heard other people have said it, and unfortunately in my younger days, I have been guilty of saying it as well, that when I hear about those type of situations, like, oh, I feel bad, she shouldn't have done that. But if that was me, it wouldn't have gone that far. Or if that was me, he would have left with some marks on him, I would have gone down, you know, fighting. I am basically, while I'm empathizing with what she is going through, I'm also placing judgment that she should have done more. She could have done better in a situation. She had, should have looked ahead and knew this was coming on. It is nobody's fault about a domestic violence situation. We should all respect one another and make sure that we are respecting each part, everybody physically, meaning that we should not lay hands on anybody unless we're defending ourselves, and also mentally. So whenever we're empathizing, if you see someone in the hallway in the classroom who is being bullied or who may be struggling because of a physical disability or someone who's struggling in the classroom because of a learning disability um, that's going on, it's not for us to say, oh, I feel bad for them, but they should have done this. If you have to attach that but to the end, or if it was me, dot, 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 then that's where we're adding judgment. And so we just want to make sure that we keep that dot, 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 or that but out of the equation. And then the next one is curiosity. We want to be able to be curious about what is going on and about how things are handling, because we all have a sense of wonder about us. We want to know how things work. You're in 4-H, not because you get cute little, and I shouldn't say cute for the men in the room, but you get great <laughs> uniforms. You're able to do that. You're curious about how things are, how to raise animals, how, you know, looking at agriculture, looking at the state government, looking at all of this stuff. You're curious and you want to find out more. The thing about it is, is that we don't want to be so intrusive that is going to be offensive to the next person or to the person who we are talking about. So any questions about that? Okay, so now we're gonna do an activity. So I am going to pick, well, I'm gonna ask just one person who would like to volunteer to be the narrator, just one person. Is that Kiara? Is that, did I say that correctly? Yes. Okay, Kiara. Unfortunately, I saw your name first and I like the way that you spell it. So I am gonna ask you to be the narrator. So what that means, I want you, and don't mind the instructions there because I had to modify a little bit because of the setting that we're in. I want you to think of your favorite room. Don't say it out loud, but I want you to think of your favorite room, okay? And I want you to think about what's in it, what it looks like. It could be a bedroom, it could be a space, um, like a hotel room. Yes, I do like hotel rooms because I don't have to clean them up afterwards, so that's my favorite room. Um, it could be the kitchen, it could be the dining room, the living room, whatever space it is that you want. I want you to visualize what it looks like. So now everybody else, and I'm gonna ask if everybody can be unmuted as long as you don't have too heavy of a background noise. I want you to have a conversation. The key is you are not allowed to ask Kiara what her room is. You can ask, well, you can't ask any questions whatsoever. You're just gonna have a conversation with her. Now the key is no questions. So, how are you gonna do this? How can I figure out what room this is? Like I said, I make a statement. My favorite room is the hotel room because, well, I'm not gonna say the hotel, me, I'm gonna say the hotel room. Here, you're not gonna say anything. You're gonna be like, I like the hotel room because it's a bed, it's comfortable, it's like everything kind of like laid out 
And so Kiara, I want you to be able to respond without saying the room that you're in, but what is it that you like about your room? Okay, yep, go ahead, Kiara. It's quiet and... It's it, what? It's quiet. Oh, quiet space. It has... Sometimes, I don't know. So does anybody else on the call have a space that is quiet for them? Yeah, so I actually enjoy my bedroom because not many people bother me there and I get to sleep in peace most of the time. Yes. Tyler, that's a very good thing. I Living alone, I can sleep anywhere in peace. But that is a really good thing about your bedroom. So, Kiara, is there something in your room, without saying what it is, that are you able to sleep in peace there as well? Mm. You can just say no. No. What do you like to do in that room? Read. Read, okay. Does anybody else have a space in their particular um, establishment that they like to either read, listen to music, play on their phone? You know, my favorite place is I have this chair that I bought from J.C. Penney. It was kind of a out of the box type of thing. It was only 20 bucks, but that is my favorite chair. It sits in my bedroom, but I take it out because it's collapsible and put it on the patio. I'll put it in the den. It just is like a cocoon and I just like to sit in it. I don't know why, but it's very comfortable for me. So Kiara, Describe something else about your room. It's kind of small, but okay. it has a lot of like storage space. Okay. Does any, can anybody guess what it may be? I'm going with the bathroom. Is it a Hi. bathroom? Yes. <laughs> Why did I know that it was the bathroom? Probably because, <laughs> ladies, unfortunately, we love the bathroom. It has every amenity that you could possibly want. It has a mirror. It has all of our things where you can do our hair, makeup, if you wear makeup, and all of that. Sometimes I spend way too much time in my bathroom, especially if I have to get ready for work. But... The thing about it is, is that I know with this virtual setting, it's a little bit um, different, but I want you to get the hang of being able to have a conversation with someone. The more that you share about yourself, the more information you can gather about some, somebody else. So like when Tyler was saying how he loves his bedroom because it's quiet, he can sleep, nobody really bothers him there. Kiara mentioned, you know, she likes to read in her space. She likes to do this. So even though it may have not been in the bathroom versus the bedroom, it's still one of those things that they love to do something that is very peaceful and quiet to them. And they have a space that they can go to to do that. So just being able to have a conversation with someone without asking any questions you can gain a lot of information. So whenever you are able to get close to your friends again, just try to have a conversation, share something about yourself and see how they respond, see how they handle things. Like for me, people are talking about movies and I'm like, yeah, I do not do horror movies. It took until Pirates of the Caribbean came out on cable before I watched it because I thought it was a scary movie because it has skeletons and zombies and all of that stuff. I'm not doing that in a theater. I'm too sensitive for all of that. So 
just being able to have that conversation. So now my friends know they don't even invite me to a movie certain times because I will, I said, why didn't you invite me? I'm feeling left out. And they were like, well, we're going to go see The Invisible Man. We know that you don't like that type of suspenseful stuff. Ah, see, you do like me. You do care. And you're right. I wasn't going to go see it. <laughs> so that's one of the things that we want to be careful about. Okay, so. I'm clicking. Give me. Okay. So, what did you feel about the process of not answering, asking any questions? How did that make you feel? How do you think you can have a conversation without asking questions? Is that David? What I think about with not being asked questions in a conversation, that can, it can be a little bit difficult to sometimes have important conversations without having questions. And what do you mean by that? Well, it's some, in some type of conversations, you need to ask questions, and then you can't really have those conversations because you can't ask those questions. Okay. Can you give one example of a situation where you would need to ask a question? Anybody can respond. What's your name? Yeah, what's your name? That's true. Are you injured? Any type of emergency situation? If it's an emergency. Speaking as an attorney. I'm sorry, say that again. Speaking as an attorney, I always have to ask questions. <laughs> that is true. You have to get to the heart of, of everything that's going on. But some of the questions you will probably also ask, you know, follow up questions as well. And how you formulate your question is going to be based on the individual's response or the information that they're giving to you, right? And so when you're looking at that, you may have to ask questions when you're trying to get directly, and this is where we go into our indirect versus direct communications, when I need to get to the point. If you're taking a test, a teacher is not going to want to have a conversation if you know the answer or not, or trying to figure that out. So if she says, what is the capital of North Carolina? You're not going to say, well, you know, back in 1862, we really didn't do this and didn't do that. So are you referring to modern day? You don't want to do something like that. You want to say, Raleigh, okay, move on. Let's keep it going. And so that's one of the things that you want to, to be able to look at the situation that you're in and be able to interpret when you can and when you should not ask questions. So what do you think some of the strengths are, and we already discussed some of the limits when we're talking about getting um, to direct answers. What do you think some of the strengths are would be of not asking questions and just having a conversation, kind of like a give and take? So one of the strengths might be that neither person really has to share more than they want to. They don't feel obligated. Yes, very good. Definitely so. Because how many of you really want to share your deepest, darkest secrets to everybody who walks by you? Not me. Anybody else? If if your purpose is building rapport with a person, it is a whole lot better to, to have a conversation um, where uh, asking questions is not the primary thing that you're doing. You're not asking for answers. You're um, uh, sharing, enjoying the same thing, talking about food, whatever it is that you're talking about. That's a better way of, of, of building uh, rapport on a personal level. Yes, it is. And the thing about it is, is that because I am somewhat forcing you to engage in this activity, 
everybody's like, I don't know what to do or how to say this, like this doesn't make sense. But in actuality, we do this on a day-to-day -day basis or a majority of our life. How many of you have waited in line or stayed in a group or somewhere with somebody next to you, you don't know, and you just started just, just speaking like, oh, I can't believe this line is this long. I have other things to do. And then somebody who is around you, either in a Starbucks line, the DMV line, you know, whatever you're waiting for, the doctor's office, they start having a conversation with you. You're like, I agree. I thought I was going to come here this early to avoid, you know, this large line or to this. This is something where you're engaging with somebody who you don't know, never seen a day in your life. And you're just like, okay, we're either going to sit here, stand here awkwardly and just stare at the ground or at our nails or whatever the case may be, or someone will just make a statement and you just feel the urge like, yeah, I agree. This is what happened this. And the next thing you know, you started sharing things and you may have something in common. You may not have anything in common. You may start thinking, I need to get away from this person as fast as I can. Let me run. But you may be like, okay, this is a cool individual. <laughs> you know, I never thought about that. But that's something that we do whenever we are in crowds or in whatever the situation may be, especially if you're going to a party and you do not know every single person there, you just start up a conversation. You don't walk up to an individual who you never met and say, oh, damn. So tell me about the top 10 things in your life. You know, you just don't start that type of conversation with somebody who you've never met. So this is actually something that we do, we just need to be more intentional uh, when we're moving forward with other um, people. Okay, so any thoughts, any comments from anybody about this presentation? Not just me, I'm not talking about me, I'm just talking about the whole activity of communication. Any comments? So when we're looking at some of our last thoughts, we want to make sure that we're open to new ideas and accepting values and beliefs of others' opinions. Because the thing about it is we really want them to respect our ideas and our values and our opinions. We just want to be mindful that everybody is not going to like the same things that we do. It doesn't mean that they're hating on us. It doesn't mean that they're trying to bully us. If you do not like the color black and I am wearing a black shirt, it's just a matter of opinion. I'm wearing this because it has my departmental's logo on it. And I didn't have to iron it too much because <laughs> it's a dry fit. But the thing about it is, is that we have to accept those things that people are different than us. Having diversity does not mean bad. It doesn't mean that I automatically have to accept everything about that other individual as my life. It just means that it's different. You know, just like we have people who are different. You have people who, are, who have blonde hair, black hair, brunettes, redheads. It's just something different. That doesn't mean that if I meet somebody who has red hair, that I now have to go and dye my hair red in order to be friends with that individual. We wanna be able to communicate openly and honest. A lot of times we feel obligated to just automatically agree with somebody because we don't want to look as the bad guy in the situation. And that can actually do more harm than good when we're looking at the situation. If I say, if somebody is telling me I need you to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, then if I'm looking at my calendar of what I already have planned, I can't say yes, because then I'm going to be overworked. Something is going to fall through the cracks. If I'm doing an experiment, it's going to fall apart. Or if I am looking at, I need to be very precise when I'm doing something and um, somebody wants me to do something differently. If I'm not saying, you know what, I can't do this then it can actually put in jeopardy of uh, what it actually is that I need to do. Because with 4-H, whenever you're going into competitions, you have 
a list of rules and regulations that you have to abide by whenever you're going to compete in whatever category it is. The thing that you want to be mindful of is somebody says, oh, no, you don't have to do that. Go ahead and do this. You have to be honest and say, you know what? I really can't. This rule, this regulation states that I have to do it this way, and I don't want to be deducted points or be eliminated because of that. Being honest about something does not mean that you are a negative person or that you're a bully. It just means that you have a different opinion, and if you want people to respect your truth, you also have to respect theirs as well. Also, do not take comments, emotions of individuals too personally. Again, when I gave the example of me crossing my arms, it could be because I am just cold in this situation. It does not mean that I am irritated with you. I'm trying to be standoffish or to send you negative vibes. So we don't want to take things too personal. And sometimes, and all of us are guilty of doing this, if we are having a bad day, everybody around us is going to have a bad day. <laughs> we may not do it intentionally and, you know, on purpose of I'm going to walk up to you and I'm going to make sure that you're having a bad day, but your interaction is not going to be as favorable as it was in the past. And so I just have to realize if somebody snaps at me or is very short with me, okay, it's not about me unless I know I walked in there and I did something to that person to cause them to be that way. And then I just give them their space and then I go around. And typically that person will come in and say like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to snap at you. I was just, you know, woody woo, what was going on with that person. So you just wanna make sure um, that you take that into control, into consideration. Um, acknowledge the contributions of others. So if somebody, and that doesn't mean that you have to give everybody credit or that, but acknowledge that individuals are making contributions to the team, to the um, group project, to whatever it is. And also acknowledge the contributions, you know, with today's climate that's going on with all the protests, all of the social media and everybody, if they are having these problems. And there are some individuals who say, I do not see color. I see everybody as a human race. That's fine. That's perfectly great that you would treat everybody the same because you really should treat everybody the same. But the thing about it is, is that we also have to acknowledge that because of our cultural background, that certain ethnic groups, races, different cultures, had made contributions based on the situation that they were um, raised in. So if you look at the Native American population, a lot of people, especially nowadays, are starting to look at some of the techniques and some of the things that they have used for centuries of growing crops in the remote deserts and the landfills that they're in and how they're conserving water and how they're doing this or looking at different climates and how they're able to go against or be fruitful, if you will, in those particular climates. People are looking at, if you're looking at Netflix, there's this documentary of um, Madam C.J. Walker, who was the first African-American millionaire um, because of her hair care products. And she did that because she was an African-American and the texture of her hair, if you can see mine, and wanting it to be straight or uniform or to be more healthy. So because of her upbringing, because of her being in a situation of having that type of texture led to this big beauty um, brand that you have for this population. So that's the same thing when we're looking at every ethnic group, every culture that's out there. Acknowledge their contributions in your group. Acknowledge what it is that they're doing. You want credit for what you do. Everybody else wants credit for what they do. And then understand different origins of humor. So I put this in there because some things individuals may find funny, like me. I try sometimes make a lot of wisecracks. To me, it's not me trying to be funny. It's just my personality. But I also know 
that sometimes my quote unquote personality does not translate well to other individuals, especially the older population. They're just like, ugh, what are you looking at? Um, but just realize that things come off differently and that sometimes individual's humor is not to harm you. Now, if it's one of those slapstick humors or slap me humors where somebody wants to come up and throw a pie in your face, then yeah, we're gonna need to understand where our boundaries are and that this is not particularly funny to me, it's offensive, it could have harmed me, I got pie in my eye and all of that that's going on. And so we just wanna make sure that we understand that it's not particularly offensive we just have to say, oh, you know what? That's something that we, we don't do or that I'm not used to, or I don't find it funny, which goes back to being honest. If somebody wants to always play practical jokes on you, depending on the, how extreme they are, you know what? I really am not a practical joker. I don't do that. So I will respect you and appreciate if you do not do that to me. We can find other ways to be humorous and so forth, but you just have to be able to have that type of communication. So with that, I say thank you for having me again <laughs> this year. I appreciate, I wish I was there in person um, with all of you guys. Why? Because you always have great snacks towards the end that I can partake in but I enjoy having this conversation with you guys and I hope that you're able to get something out of it and be able to use these techniques once we are able to somewhat be together again while apart. Any questions, comments, surveys saying, Steve, never invite this person back again? I don't think that's gonna happen, Natasha. <laughs> 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 now, I, I want to thank you uh, very much again for your presentation. And as they're thinking about questions, and please either start to type them in the chat or if you want to open up your mic, you can do that. But Natasha, one that I've just kind of been thinking about for a while now, it seems. But, um, you know, Doug and I may not agree on things, mm -hmm. and that's okay. But it's how we disagree on things that allows us to help our relationship move forward. Yes. So do you have any thoughts on how we can have those, what I call civil discussions or civil conversations that allow us to express our opinions and that's okay, but not to maybe attack the other person? Yeah, I think with that, you really have to be open to listen to the other person's point of view. Um, so if you and Doug are having a conversation, I'm just gonna use the barbecue sauce. Um, from North Carolina because there's the tomato base versus the vinegar base and if you go to South Carolina sometimes they have mustard base but we don't count them but if you're looking at the two being able to hear each other's point of view and being able to understand why they may feel that way um, towards that now if you just completely disagree there's nothing wrong with that but one of the things that I like to set is your rules of engagement or the art of war. You know, lay down some guidelines of saying, hey, we're about to, to really get into this and I really wanna hear you. So let's just agree that one, we're not gonna interrupt each other while we're speaking. Two, we're going to respect each other's point of view. And then three, when this is all said and done, it does not define or eliminate our relationship um, that we have. And just being able to, to do that, but I think it's going to have to be on one side to really like give in, like to be that example, to set the example of what it means to listen actively without interrupting. And hopefully the other person will follow suit of what you're doing. Now, if you're getting into really hardcore issues that are going to define the relationship, I'm not saying that you should end the relationship. Um, so one of the big things that you see, um, I think it was brought up when they were talking when we talked about the electoral race and you know the election. A lot of individuals were defriending people on social media or not hanging out with them because they supported Hillary Clinton versus Trump and vice versa. And so you really have to look to see if the morals and the ethnic views, not ethnic, ethics. Um, 
really go with yours. Because the thing about it is, is that I have a friend and he's a white male and we have fun together. One of his friends is a Trump supporter, which I do not have a problem with. You can support whoever it is that you want to. But whenever that individual starts to make certain comments and certain um, suggestions that do not align with the way that I view people of a different race or of a different culture, then I really have to take a step back and say, I hear you. I know where you're coming from. Maybe you need to look at a little bit more education on both sides, just not a one sided, just to see my view, but a little bit on both sides. And then if you can't come, we can still be friends, but we need to be friends at a distance. You know, something like this may be an off topic thing that we, we just don't discuss again. And if we're getting into a situation where this is coming up, we separate or we just, you know, cut it short. But to argue, I love to argue. Conflict brings beautiful ideas. It brings compromise. And I don't mean argue like we're getting into a WWE SmackDown um, type of situation, but we're able to exchange ideas. And during the exchange of ideas, we are coming together to really see like, okay, you feel this way about your barbecue sauce. I feel this way about my barbecue sauce. Maybe we can agree that on a barbecue sandwich of pulled pork, the tomato base works very well because it adheres to the meat and it doesn't run and soak up and make the bread <laughs> uh, soggy. But if we're looking at like the vinegar base, that's something great to base it. I know I went back to barbecue sauce, but you know, we can use the vinegar base because you can use it in different type in other applications and, and so forth. But I think having some rules, some guidelines, and just being honest and listening to each other and understanding this is not my view, this is your view, and I'm okay with that as long as you respect my view in the situation. That was a long explanation, but I hope I answered it for you before you Absolutely. end up. Absolutely. We'll, we'll work on that, I promise. We'll, we'll yeah. try to do better. And I know <laughs> but, Doug is AKA for Dan, but I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> No, but and definitely that mutual mutual respect is really really a critical piece of that. Mm -hmm. Other question or two for Natasha before we move into wrap up mode today. Not a question, but I just want to say thanks for presenting. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm glad that you did enjoy it. I try to do things that are relevant because the older I get, I realize I'm turning into my mom and I try not to do that <laughs> as much. But Steve has my contact. So if you have questions after the fact, or if you just need time for this to kind of digest um, in order to formulate what your questions are going to be, please just let him know he'll pass on my information and I would be happy to have a conversation or an email exchange with you. Well, Natasha, thank you once again. Just really appreciate you spending time with us this morning. Um, lots of good information and we, we really appreciate your time with us. No problem, anytime. Even though I'm not in 4-H, I do appreciate you guys. I do love, and I do love the fair because I am just curious about all the animals until the cows start to pee on me. Then I got to leave. <laughs> you're, you're, you're too close if that happens. <laughs> I okay. know. But now I can recognize whenever I see the tail start to rise, I move away. <laughs> see, it's a, a, a teachable moment, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Well, thank you so much for having me. I hope you have a great weekend. You be safe. You wash your hands. And again, if there's anything you need from the College of Science, just let me know, okay? Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, Natasha. Thank All right, you. you too. All right, Doug, I'm going to share a screen again here, and then it's going to be your turn for a minute or two. All right, great. So then, at this time, we want to uh, talk about what we've done these last three days, and uh, several of you have been with us for all three, and we thank you for doing that. Uh, one of the main things we wanted to do was to empower you. So. That's what this has been all about, and to show you that you are important, that you can do things, you can make things happen, you can make things change. 
you can do that. Uh, so many times we always wait for the other person. But we don't have to do that. We can make the change happen. We can be the one that starts the change. We can be the one who starts a project. We can be the one who starts a, a community activity. And uh, you can make that happen. You don't have to wait for other people uh, to, to do it first. You can be the first one. You can be the initiator. And we've seen that with all of the different uh, programs that we've had these last three days, the different speakers that we've had, they've talked about how you can be involved and you can start even now. You don't have to wait until you're 22 or 25. Uh, you can start at 15 and, and start making a difference in your communities. One of the things we usually do when we are together is actually take on a community project and uh, we have simulations of what it would take to start a community project and we've had some very successful ones over the years uh, maybe there's a, a, an abandoned lot in your community and that abandoned lot could be used for a community garden and you could be the one to initiate and look into what would it take to make that happen and uh, there's different resources available for community gardens or there may be a change that needs to happen in your community on the roads. We've talked about uh, the potholes in roads. One of the suggestions that came out of an earlier one of these programs was to have bump out areas on country roads so that farm implements or extra wide loads could move off to the side and allow uh, uh, passing to happen so that traffic doesn't get backed up. Uh, that was a suggestion from a group. And, and those kind of things can come. And uh, so there's lots of things you can be involved with and you can be the one that makes it happen. So that's what's next for you, for you to become involved in your community, to, to have that civic engagement that we talk about. And uh, it can be a small thing in your 4-H club. It can be a countywide 4-H uh, project uh, that you get involved with community service-wise. Uh, we've had uh, many different activities that way that young people have started. Uh, something with COVID-19, for example, uh, instead of just uh, being all upset about COVID-19, one of our 4-H groups in our county uh, set up a online auction with baked goods and some other items and raised money for our fairgrounds because several events got canceled. So the fair board is in a bad financial situation. So they just by doing that, they raised $1,000 and gave that to the fair board for the fairgrounds. Something simple like that, and uh, you can do those things. And uh, so don't be afraid to, to be the one that starts things up. That's a very, very good statement, Doug. Thank you for sharing that. Definitely, there's lots of things that can be done. They don't have to be huge, but they have to start somewhere. So mm -hmm. very, very good. Dan and Katie, I'll give you a chance to give some final thoughts or comments this morning. I just want to say thank you. Um, this has been an awesome couple of days. Um, you guys have just remind me kind of why I do my job. Um, and I, like Doug said, encourage you to go out, get involved, and find what you can do next. And I likewise would like to say thank you. And... Uh, um, to add a little bit to what uh, Doug uh, said about where do you go from here, uh, no, no step is too small. And so you don't have to start large. You can start with one small thing and don't be discouraged if it doesn't happen right away. I've been working with uh, state government for a while now and uh, some good ideas don't make it through the first time. Uh, sometimes it takes a couple of tries before people get it, people in, in, in decision-making roles get it, and, and then it comes, and, and, then, it, and then it happens. So um, start small and be deliberate and keep at it. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Katie. Uh, students, anything that you'd like to share with us? Got a couple of closing slides here, but if there's a comment that you all would like to make, I'd be happy to to take that right now. OK, 
Okay, if you think of it here in the next couple of minutes, you still got a chance. I wanted to, to share with you like we did yesterday, just a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to write it down or, or to put it on your calendar, here's a chance to do that again. We have another uh, online conference coming up next week, and that's gonna be our State 4-H Junior Leader Conference. Uh, it's going to be held next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday afternoons from three until 6 p.m. each day, and that's Eastern time. So that'd be two to five for the extreme Northwest and Southwest part of our states. Uh, but we've got some really cool things that are put together. We have a, um, a State 4-H Junior Leader Council. That's a group of high school and early college students that help to put on that conference each year. And they have really come up with a good plan. They had to transition to as we had to move to an online format, but they've done a really good job with that. Uh, so our Tuesday program is going to include a keynote speaker. He's also a comedian, so he's going to entertain us while helping us to learn. Uh, Craig Tornquist is going to do a fantastic job. He has lots of interactive activities activities built into his presentation. So looking forward to, to hearing what he has to share with us. We'll also be able to do some skill sessions and those are uh, various topics that the uh, Junior Leader Council has put together. And they've got, they're relatively short, about a half hour each, and they'll be able to, to, to share some things with you. They've got some activities built in, and there's gonna be information there that you can take and use personally, but you'll also be able to share that with other uh, groups like yourselves uh, throughout your community. On that Wednesday session, in addition, we're going to be able to do a service project. It's going to be an online one. So each of us is going to kind of be doing our own thing uh, where, we're, where we're located, but you'll need either an old pair of jeans or an old t-shirt and a pair of scissors. And uh, don't plan to wear those after you're, after you're done with them, but they will be turned into a neat project for you. And then on Thursday, we'll have a chance to do a networking event where we have business and industry professionals joining us. We'll be uh, in some breakout rooms. You'll be able to learn about their career, but also learn about things that you can do to prepare yourself for whatever career you're interested in. So they'll do some things uh, that will help you to uh, interact better with uh, future employers and be able to get to meet some folks that you haven't had a chance to meet before. So that again is coming up next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We're really excited to be able to uh, share that with you uh, next week. A couple of things that relate to the, uh, civic engagement. One of those is our Global Gateway Experience that happens in Howell, Michigan. And it uh, is kind of a simulation where you're going to learn about what it's like to live in hunger for a very short time frame, but realize what happens around the world in relation to a global hunger needs. And they'll be in a simulated village where you can kind of, uh, you're given a part of a, of, of a part of the ingredients that you need for a meal, but not everything. And you have to work together to figure out how to make that all come together. So we take teams of, from each county. We take teams of four youth and one adult. You're in grades, I believe it is eight to 11. And we encourage you to come and work together with that. We do have some openings. So if you're interested in forming a team from your community, check with your 4-H educator to ask me. We can get you additional information about that. And then we have an Indiana 4-H Leadership Summit coming up in November. It's on a Saturday. We have a number of different sessions that we'll be learning about from topics including civic engagement, but also healthy living and science. And you'll have a chance to see some recognition of our adult and our teen volunteers, as well as the 4-H Accomplishment Scholarship recipients. Those of you interested in 4-H junior leaders, that's typically our middle school and high school students in 4-H, uh, you'll be able to, to take part in a new curriculum coming up this fall. It's called, four, or called a hashtag adulting 101, and it's a chance for you to learn some skills that you will need uh, as you leave home. Some of those you may already know, some of them you may not. And so you get a chance to, to learn a little bit more about those and things that really will be helpful to you as you move into the future. If you're thinking about college and thinking maybe about Purdue, there's a chance that you can get some, uh, some of your tuition covered and some of your credits out of the way before you get to Purdue, uh, saving a lot of money on, along the way. If you're interested in the Fast Start program, we would encourage you to check out that purdue.university slash Fast Start link. And again, that will be posted on our website so you'll be able to look a little bit more about that as well. Really want to thank you again for being a part of this. I want to extend a special thanks to Dan and Doug and Katie for all the work that they put in throughout this year, getting ready for it. Uh, we too made a transition from in-person to online, but I uh, really appreciate your participation, really appreciate their support as we made this happen. Uh, lots of speakers that were able to join us and that was also a lot of fun. We really do want to hear from you. There is the link that's uh, there on the side and maybe Katie, if you could type that in again for the students in the, in the group chat, I won't try to do that and talk today, uh, but that is the purdue.ag slash CE20 
reaction. It's a very short, uh, very short uh, survey. It's just asking you something that you've learned from this experience that you think you're going to learn in the future, or use in the future rather. And we really hope that you'll be able to take a moment to, to fill out that question for us. If you didn't get to sign in today, there's the, also the one that's, that ends with the participation and that uh, lets us know that you were here. And we'll be able to follow up with some things. Once I get everything posted on the website, we'll follow up with you just to make sure that you know it's all there for you as well. But uh, at this point, again, thank you. We really appreciate you being with us these last couple of days and hope that you found some things uh, beneficial. We've got a couple of comments in the chat that indicate that you enjoyed the program and, and we appreciate hearing that too. So with that, we wish you the best. Have a great weekend. Hope to see you at some other events coming up in the summer and on into the fall. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much.